so today I'm Dr. Vishal, as most of you are aware about. I'm uh, talking, going to talk about uh, high-risk biventricular repair with the heterotaxy syndromes and the post-operative challenges. Now, this is a very vast topic, if I may tell you very frankly. To make it into a concise presentation is going to be a bit of a challenge. But I presume that uh, since the topic was circulated a little while back, a few of you, especially the cardiology guys, would have gone through the heterotaxy and its associated issues, and it will make life a little bit easier. I've tried to keep it very simple, so let's see how it goes, and then subsequently you can have questions, and later on, if you cannot ask just now, you can always mail me up, right? So the heterotaxy syndromes, as we all know, are basically the abnormal left and right axis patterning of the organs of the body. So you can have a bilateral right-sidedness, for example, both the lungs with the uh, a right side, uh, a typical right side lung configuration like a trilobar bronchus or a bilateral left sidedness. Similarly, systemic involvement is the rule with most associated effects common to both variants, though biliary atresia and extrahepatic portosystemic anastomosis occur with polysplenia only. Now, univentricular repair in most of the case scenarios, as we would, we'll go further in the side, you realize that it is mostly we are dealing with one hypoplastic ventricle. So in the, till maybe a decade back, a lot of surgeons would just prefer doing a univentricular, go down the univentricular pathway, tried and tested, okay, you do a BT shunt maybe or a PA band earlier, or you do a Glenn followed by a Fontan at the right time and then follow it up over a long period of time. But we all understand, anybody who's in this field for a, at least more than a decade knows that even the best of Fontans, the quality of life after a certain age suffers. So hence the thought process towards biventricular repair. Why do we think of a biventricular repair? So primarily the long-term prospects are better if a good repair is achieved. Obviously that's the first basic requirement that the good repair should be achieved. We should not have too many residual problems, otherwise the entire purpose gets defeated. Avoid long-term anticoagulation. Besides, a bioventricular repair comes with its own caveats like prolonged ICU stay for obvious reasons because you are training a hyperplastic ventricle to become a good enough ventricle to salvage the patient for the rest of his life. So obviously it's going to be a prolonged ICU stay with a relatively stormy ICU course. Prolonged pleural drainage, very commonly associated. Besides, you require a lot of intensive nutritional rehab in the post-operative period, partially because of the feeding issues even before surgery and occasionally because of the post-operative long stay which both things sometimes just add on to the issues. And sepsis in various forms. Any patient who stays longer in the ICU, you know, sepsis can come in in some form or other, and we always face it, and we have to learn to deal with it, right? When, again, when we talk of a hyperplastic ventricle, it's always important to know that what is, what do we understand of balance? Because all of you would have heard the, the term unbalanced, balanced AVSD, unbalanced ventricles, and so on and so forth. So the concept of balance is extremely important when we think of doing a complete repair in a case of a slightly smaller ventricle. So understand how small is small. So with atrial ventricle septal defect, the AV valves, regardless of the number of orifices, may be more committed to one ventricle with relative hyperplasia of the other. So this concept of balanced is primarily associated with a situation called common AV canal is a defect or a atrioventricular septal defect. So it's very important to see why the number of orifices are committed to which ventricle with hyperplasia of which ventricle. Then if the AV inlet is equally shared by both the ventricles, then this is consistent with the term balanced. Unbalanced AVSD involves a hyperplastic ventricle with a common AV valve, and the larger ventricle in this situation is termed as a dominant, the smaller one obviously hyperplastic. Now, 10% of all AVVSDs are supposedly unbalanced. A right ventricular dominant is obviously more common committed to RV. Two thirds of the entire unbalanced population is right ventricular dominant, with more than half of the AV junction committed to the right ventricle. It is often associated with severe coarctation of aorta and aortic arch anomalies, whereas the left ventricular dominant, which is primarily associated with Down syndrome unbalanced AVSD, is associated primarily with the pulmonary valve stenosis or atresia. So just for your remembering part, right side dominant AVSD is associated with left side major vessel anomalies, whereas the left side dominant AVSD is associated with the right side great vessel anomalies or great valve anomalies. On 2D echo and probably the car
Does the audience want me to Let's go to the slides again? OK, OK. So just to uh, rewind quickly. Heterotaxy syndromes basically involve the abnormal left and right axis patterning of the organs of the body. So you can have a bilateral right sidedness or a bilateral left sidedness. So you can have a person with uh, especially uh, heterotaxy, the right side heterotaxy syndromes with both the lungs with right trilobar bronchi sort of a pattern, whereas the left side, bilateral left sidedness is opposite. Right sidedness would have uh, asplenia, left sidedness would have a polysplenia, so on and so forth. Systemic involvement is the rule with most associated effects common to both variants, so biliary atresia and extrahepatic portosystemic anastomosis occur with polyspenia only. Okay, now the univentricular repair, because if you have worked for almost a decade in this field, you understand that in most of the hyperheterotaxis syndromes with a hypoplastic ventricle, which is a common association, the univentricular repair is always the safer and tried and tested method. People have become very comfortable with the idea of doing a BT shunt oblique PA band at the new and early neonatal period or infancy, and then a blend, and then followed by a fontan. But the quality of life after a fontan procedure, suppose we go beyond 25 years, obviously is we all know there are issues and we all are facing it day in and day out, especially in the following up of these previous fontans done around 20 years back. So hence there's a little bit of movement of the thought process towards giving a bioventricular repair, even though at a high risk immediately for patients with hyperplastic ventricles. And the reason being again, because if you are able to achieve a good repair, the long term prospects as far as the quality of life is definitely better. You give two functioning ventricles to the patient, A. You avoid long term anticoagulation. It comes with its own caveats, obviously, like prolonged ICU stay with relatively stormy ICU course. Obviously, you have a small ventricle which has to learn how to function as a systemic ventricle. It is going to, it's going to be a challenge. We all have to face it. Only then, if you survive this challenge, you can talk about the long term prospects. Prolonged crural rages is a given, and intensive nutritional rehab in the post-operative period is an important thing, primarily because of the feeding issues which have been pre-operatively existing, and occasionally also because of the fact that your post-operative course is longer. And any patient who stays long at the ISU, sepsis will come in, so we need to be alert about that and treat it at the right time. Now, when we call when we, when I, when we use the word hyperplastic, the next thing in relation to heterotaxy comes out is the concept of balance. Now, AVSTs are a common association with heterotaxies, and with atrioventricular septal defect, all of you would have heard this term balanced, unbalanced AVSD. So, one should understand that the AV valves, regardless of the number of orifices, may be more committed to one ventricle with relative hyperplasia of the other. Now, in the situation that the AV inlet is equally shared by both ventricles, then this is considered a balanced AVSD. An unbalanced AVSD involves a hyperplastic ventricle with a common AV valve, and the larger ventricle is termed as the dominant ventricle. So unbalanced AVSD involves a hyperplastic with a common AV valve, and the larger ventricle is termed as a dominant ventricle. And 10% of the all AVSDs that we encounter will be in the unbalanced category. Right ventricular dominant constitutes two-thirds of this unbalanced population, and obviously it means that more than half of the AV junction is uh, committed to the RV, associated with severe coarctation of aorta and aortic arch anomalies, whereas the left ventricular dominant is associated with pulmonary valve stenosis or atresia. So just to remember it simply, right ventricular dominant associated with left great vessel valve and arch anomalies, whereas left ventricular dominant associated with the right great vessel or valve anomalies, and the left ventricular dominant is associated with Down syndrome, unbalanced AVSD most commonly. For the cardiology fellows, this is easy. For any of the intensive care fellows, just they should try to follow up the guys in the echo room to understand what we are talking here. A few of you must be aware of it, but few who are a bit new, they will have to go to the echo room to see this actually, what do we mean? Because when I use the term anterior bridging leaflet and everything, it will look, be a little bit Greek and Latin and listen until you go to the echo room. And it's not that difficult, believe me. So determining balance is the key to decide the management pathway, especially in a hyperplastic situation. Now, when you do the imaging, it allows visualization of the malalignment between the atrial and ventricular septa. 
So sub cluster selector view gives a quantitative ass assessment of the proportion of AVAL committed to ventricle. And the most common thing that one tries to see is the anterior bridging leaflet and so how it is straddling over the VSD. And that is how one determines this uh, situation. Now Cohen et al measured the area of the AV valve apportioned over each ventricle and calculated an AV valve index LV to RV ratio. The numerator is LV, the denominator is RV. So if the RV is bigger, the ratio would be lesser. Same as is to quantify left ventricular hyperplasia. And those patients with an AV valve index of less than 0.67 is a large VSD, that is with a very small LV, were directed towards the univentricular pathway. Even if this may sound very simple that you just calculate the AV ratio, see the malalignment between the ventricular atrial septum, see the orientation of the anterior bridging leaflet, there can be still some associated issues like a severity of valve malalignment may not essentially correlate with the degree of ventricular hyperplasia. Why? Because if you have the pulmonary blood flow, which is flowing through a large AST, which is rooted to the RV, and the LV remains correspondingly underfilled, which is a reality, especially when you have the streaming of the blood flow through the AST from the pulmonary veins directly to the RV. It doesn't go to the LV, especially in a primum AST. That will be associated with RV enlargement, and the LV hyperplastic, even though the LV hyperplasia by the way of the previous index would not be that bad. Again, to, before making a comment as to whether the LV is good enough to be considered as a systemic ventricle in future, in this situation it is essential to determine if LV is apex forming. And when just as a completion sake, one should know that the rastity type C AV canal is the commonest variety associated with heterotaxy syndrome. And you all know rastinite type CAV canal. I don't think so. I can elaborate out here at this point of time. Okay, where it's basically the at bridging leaflet crosses over the entire to the other side on the. Now, finally, coming to the heterotaxy. Now, heterotaxy means anomalous position of the viscera. Variation from the normal situs solitus results in heterotaxy expressed either as status ambiguous, randomization, which is not very clear, which is the right side, left side, a total mishap, basically or a complete reversal as in situs inverses. Situs ambiguous is an uncertain or indeterminate visceral or atrial position because of symmetric or indeterminate anatomy bilaterally. Okay, so you cannot really say the right-sided atrium is a RA and the left-sided atrium is the LA. It's all very, very indeterminate. And it's called situs ambiguous for obvious reasons. Okay, how to identify an RA and LA? Again, that is part of the cardiology curriculum and it must have been explained to you, like you identify it by the IVC and the pectinate muscles and the pulmonary venous drainage, and obviously your appendages, they help you identify the RA and the LA. But in a situs ambiguous, sometimes all these things fall apart. Abdominal situs ambiguous is associated with the lever that is bilateral or midline, most commonly with aspenia. Now, aspenia is associated with the right-sided heterotaxy syndromes. So right isomerism, which we call the one spectrum of, uh, or the right-sided heterotaxy syndrome, or right heterotaxy, is commonly associated with asthenia, common atrium, common AV valve, common inlet ventricle, or right ventricular type with a hyperplastic LV, and an unbalanced AVSD is more common. It can be mostly associated with mesocardia or dextrocardia. A VDA discordance or a DORV with pulmonary atresia or severe stenosis. So you can have the entire spectrum of uh, 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 the atrial ventricular discontinuity or a ventricular arterial discontinuity happening with a VA discordance or DORV with pulmonary atresia or severe stenosis. But DORV with pulmonary atresia or severe stenosis is the most common association with a dominant RV. Ventricles normally related or ventricular inversion can also be seen and absent coronary sinus with bilateral right-like appendages. This is associated with right or left AV valve atresia very occasionally and aortic atresia rarely associated. Left isomerism is associated with polymyxplenia with a dextrocardia with common inlet ventricle again of a right ventricle morphology most commonly and a double outlet RV as previously described. But here the balanced AVST is seen more often in left isomerism as compared to the right. Ventricular inversion is more frequent and partial AVST is frequently observed. Overall, you can say the incidence of heart disease or the, the severity of the heart defects is lesser. Pulmonary output tract observation obstruction is less frequent. 
you are commonly associated IVC interruption as you have a pulmonary, a TAPVC commonly associated with the right-sided anomalies. Here you have an IVC interruption with azygous or hemiazygous continuation to SVC and its lateral pulmonary veins commonly associated. So the systemic venous return anomalies are more with the left side isoparism. The pulmonary venous return anomalies are more with the right side isoparism. And with the left isoparism, you have bilateral left-like appendages. Now we come to the case scenario in a similar situation. So this is about a one year old male child with a weight of eight kg born out of a consanguineous marriage from Jammu and Kashmir. He was admitted to our unit with worsening bluish discoloration with fast breathing. He was the son of a doctor diagnosed in the neonatal period as a case of cyanotic congenital heart disease and was told that he is having a DORV but not very clear cut indication of hypoplasia or anything was associated at the local echo and they were advised regular follow-up with conservative management. When he came out here, the diagnosis was confirmed as a case of right isoparism, double outlet right ventricle, complete AVST with moderate pulmonary stenosis, and a hyperplastic LV. Our cardiologist was very confident that LV is hyperplastic, and he did not mention anything about the LV valve or AV valve index. So we, I did not have that, so I could not just fake a number out here. And but he was very sure that it's a very hyperplastic, significantly hyperplastic LV. So it was more of an eyeballing that has been done out here. And an asprenia, which was associated. The father was a surgeon. He was given the possibility of a high risk body ventricular repair with very ventricular pathway as well, in view of the small LV and the difficult rotability of the VSD to the aorta. But the father wanted to go for the high risk body ventricular repair, and ultimately the child ended with that. He was shifted to the ICU with a dobitamin of 5 microgram per kg per minute. The hemodynamics on shifting, now this is what you have to note down. A heart rate of 156, nodal rhythm, it was not even a junctional tachycardia. It was, just, it was not junctional ectopic, it was primarily a junctional tachycardia. Blood pressure of 56 by 32, LA of 13, CVP 12, peripheral skin temperature 26 degrees Celsius. He was already third space when he was shifted after the surgery lasting 7 hours with a bypass time of approximately 270 minutes and a borderline oxygenation with the PO2 in the first blood gas around 45 or 46. There was no communication according to the ECHO report and the 2D ECHO which was done revealed a bioventricular dysfunction, no significant LVOT or RVOT gradient, no residual VST, no pericardial connection. Now, is it an RV or LV failure? Anybody from the audience would like to make an attempt. What we are dealing with? A BP of 56, LA 13, CEP 12. What do you think in this situation? I already mentioned it was a hyperplastic LV, so everybody does understand that it's an LV failure. The LA is elevated, you have a small LV. You have pulmonary congestion, that's the reason your gas exchange is poor. And there's no associated hepatomegaly in the acute phase. So these are the indexes which give you an idea that probably you're dealing with more of a LV failure, right? Also, the patient had a hematuria with urine output around 1 ml per kg per hour. Bilateral basal crepitations. I have mentioned the peripheral temperature previously, which was 26. The core temperature was 37. The patient was hyperkalemic with an elevated lactate. Now, um, I've just given you a few figures out here. And I would like to see what is the understanding of the uh, candidates attending this lecture. What will be your target systolic blood pressure for this patient? You want to keep a BP of around more than 80 with a LA of 18, or less than 60 with a LA of 10, or something around 70 with a LA of 15. And what is the target mixed venous oxygen saturation? More than 70%, the ideal, or more than 60. So we have an answer, 70, 15. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else wants to make an attempt? So well, basically when you deal with a patient, yeah, I think all of you are coming out with this uh, similar answer and probably I agree with it in totality, that one should try not to have a very high blood pressure in this situation. That's very, very important. You know, sometimes we get carried away that we need to have a BP of 80 come what the LA pressure or CEP maybe for a child of 8 kilos. One needs to understand what are we dealing with. We are dealing with a small LV which is not accustomed to beat 
or take care of the systemic circulation. So I will even buy Prashant, Rajesh, a lot of guys have come out with answers that uh, a 6010 is also acceptable and maybe yes, in a situation where somebody is already having a pulmonary condition, you start with the level of a BP between 6 to 70 and LA between 10 to 15. And once the patient's lungs get better, the urine output gets better, you improve or you optimize your targets to a 70 and to LA of 15 maximum. And you will find that if you're doing the things right, gradually the BP starts getting better and the LA starts coming down. Now this is a very gradual process. One has to be patient. You cannot rush into inotropy or volume or diuresis at a knee-jerk reaction. Most important is to maintain a homeostasis where your lactates are under control, your mixed venous saturation is under control. It's not essential to have a figurative blood pressure which is normal. So any pressure between 60 to 70 with a LA between 10 to 15 is acceptable if the patient is maintaining good peripheral circulation. So that is the strategy one should follow in patients with LV failure in the immediate post-operative phase. A quick revision of the features of LCOS because that is the primary thing that you are tweeting out here. Peripheral cooling, elevated lactate, persistent metabolic acidosis, <coughs> I'm sorry, worsening hyperkalemia, borderline SBP with the oxygen saturation in this patient less than 95% and oliguria. Now another decision smoking process, whether you want to give boluses of volume or whether you want to give controlled volume, whether to use inotropy and pressures blindly or whether to apply some thought process behind it. Because sometimes in a few minutes I know that there are surgeons who will come, just start this, just start this, just start this because they are comfortable with those inotropes and pressures without really going into the science behind it. And I do believe there has to be some sort of a mental application out here. When you're dealing with situations like this, I'm not talking about regular ASD or VSD. Okay, and we talked about first pacing, which is already there. So how will you deal with it? Whether you do a diuresis with classics, whether you do a peritoneal dialysis, or whether you just be a patient, and if suppose there's hyperkalemia, how will you react to it? You'll give a lasix bolus on the after two hours of surgery, or whether you'll wait for the potassium to come down with other measures before you start a lasix infusion after a certain amount of hemodynamic stability. So the audience's view on all the three are desired, if they can provide me. Okay, controlled small liquid septal rate, Kamran says so. Diuresis, Melrinon, Vinod says so. Controlled volume with anotropy. So I'm very happy to understand that you people are already learning the concepts in the right direction and with the right thought process behind it. So that's a very good thing. Okay, so just to summarize, whatever you guys have commented upon, I'll come to the next slide. Volume strategy should be not to exceed 2 ml per kg per day of crystalloid, per hour of crystalloid. I'm sorry, this is a mistake. 2 ml per kg per hour of crystalloid. Okay, so kindly excuse the mistake. It's 2 ml per kg per hour. So it will come to 50 ml per kg per day. Okay. With LV failure or with a small LV, please avoid boluses of volume. 10 ml per kg boluses running over half an hour, one hour can be extremely detrimental, in fact, disastrous. And based on the hematocrit, choose between a packed fried blood cell or 5% albumin to tide over hypotension episodes, again given in a controlled volume rate, especially if you have a clinical and echocardiography evidence of underfilling in the form of collapsible IVC or underfilled chambers. The principles of inotropy and pressure, see everybody has their own strategy. Some people like a combination of dobitamine plus adrenaline. Some people like dobitamine, adrenaline plus melrinone. Some people like melrinone plus adrenaline. Occasionally somebody would suggest I want to use a levosium and dan plus adrenaline. Everybody can be having their own thought processes behind these combinations. You cannot say which is right, which is wrong. For, any, for everybody, whatever works, that's right. As long as there's some science behind it. So, you have to titrate the inotropy to ensure hemodynamic targets are achieved, primarily without a significant increase in heart rate. So just a few cautions. Don't exceed your dopamine and dobitamine and adrenaline, for example, beyond 10 mics or beyond 0.2 microgram per kg per minute for adrenaline. 
here in this patient, the patient was already on dobutamine with the hypertension. We went up to dobutamine to 7.5, while we gave 5% albumin in a controlled form at, at 10 ml per hour and then at 5 ml per hour. And injection at Renalin was started at 0 0.05 microgram per kg per minute. So in our unit, we rarely go to 10 mics of dobutamine. If suppose we have a situation where we have to go to 7.5 mics of dobutamine and the pressure are still not holding on, rather than going to 10 mics, we start a touch of adrenaline at 0 0.05. Now, once we were very clear that the filling pressures have been achieved and consistently documented, mildenone was built up very gradually to a total dose of 0.5 microgram per kg per minute. Now, here we did not require pressures in the immediate period, but there can be situation where you, in spite of giving a dobutamine, adrenaline, your patient's pressures are still not holding. You cannot think of mildenone because the pressures are not holding. And ultimately, you have to add pressures, something like a noradrenaline or maybe a vasopressin, for a temporary duration, especially if there's evidence similar to CPB-induced warm shock. So the peripheral temperature will help you in taking a call on this. One should consider IV steroids definitely in a catecholamine-resistant situation. Okay, if your adrenaline, noradrenaline does not function, not functioning, not leading to any change in the patient's outcome, think of a IV steroids in a catecholamine-resistant situation while you are also starting something like a vasopressin, which is a pressure of choice in this situation. Now, this child gradually stabilized, but significant third space persisted in spite of adequate dietary response. Like he was passing almost like four to five ml per kg per hour with consistently stable hemodynamics. But the third spacing was taking very long to go. Now, if somebody's third spacing is persisting beyond the second or third post-operative day, it's obvious that you get concerned and the concerns will lead you to certain investigations. So what further investigations you would like to order out here, my friends? Albumin, HB, total protein albumin, fine. Okay, something more? A PCT, yeah. So that is what I'm coming to next. One has urine curitin, very good. So just to summarize, what all of you have listed, I'll go through this chart with what happened in this patient. We did a serum albumin. It was 2.4 on the third POD. Uh, hematocrit was 36. His pre op hematocrit was around 45, so it was not too bad. The deranged sepsis screen with neutrophilic cells. So his TLC was something like a 27,000 with thrombocytopenia with PCT 7.5. And we do understand the 7.5 is high. And hence, the patient's antibiotics were modified after sending cultures. And carbapenems were started straight off, especially with the background of asthenia. And the patient was given an albumin 20% infusion, targeting 1 to 2 gram per kg per day delivery over the next 24 hours to expedite albumin-induced diuresis, and also given again after a gray break for the next 24 hours. So here we do use albumin very routinely, okay, and especially when such situation where third spacing persists and you also have a evidence of sepsis, albumin-induced diuresis is probably better because it draws out the extra volume from the third space adds on to the intravascular volume, and also helps with improving the urine output. So this is something, if you have not tried, you can try it out, if your surgeon also agrees to it. Once the third spacing was reduced with improved biventricular contractility documented on ECHO, the patient was gradually weaned while nasogastric feeding was optimized. And he was extubated on nasal CPAP on the seventh POD, but this fellow required a prolonged nasal CPAP, almost more than 10 to 12 days due to excessive secretions and recurrent atelectasis. He also had a recurrence of fever with clapsy, which grew basically the central line on the ninth day was removed, and then it grew uh, enterobacter cloacae, and antibiotics were modified based on the sensitivity, and the patient actually required colostin therapy for 14 days because he also had fever, and the TLC was again starting to go on the higher side. The PCT again went to something like a 8.5. It came down to uh, 2.6 and then again rose up to 8.5 and then we had to change off. The patient was reintubated on the 15th priority primarily due to respiratory compromise with desaturation and altered sensorium. So around the 15th POD, he became very exhausted and we had to put him with a little bit of, uh, where there was hypoxic behavior was beginning to fall in and we had to just like sort of, and the secretions were just not getting mobilized in spite of all the humidification and everything that we do normally. 
So the patient was having secretion stuck in the lungs with recurrent areas of atelectasis on both the sides, and with that respiratory compromise, he got reintubated. As I earlier told you, the patient was delayed on the ninth POD, but required central and again in the short duration of six days, as he had some allergy to ibuprofen, which was given as the combination with paracetamol for the pain relief after the patient was started on NGPH post extubation. But it led to significant skin exfoliations within the first 12 hours of the dose given. So there was a sort of a time, uh, time and cause effect relationship with uh, ibuprofen, and hence uh, the patient had never received it before. So hence we sort of uh, checked it out on this list that he should not be given ibuprofen unless and until he's being observed in future as well. But I'm not sure it is entirely ibuprofen out here because there may be an element of sepsis exacerbation, which can also lead to similar skin exfoliations. But it's always better to play safe. A repeat 2D echo was done again after the child got reintubated and it showed good bioventricular function with no evidence of infective endocarditis. The patient was again extubated on nasal CPAP on the 20th POD and subsequently required nasal CPAP for four days. The supports were gradually de escalated and the patient shifted to the ward on the 26th post operative day. He required very gradual transition to oral feeds in view of the clinical gastroesophageal reflux that he had. Which was treated with antacids and prokinetic measures. So our transition time from the NGPs to oral feeds was almost like a duration of seven to eight days. And he was discharged on the 34th POD with advice regarding vaccination and prophylaxis with amoxicillin. And he has come back and follow up subsequently. He was operated as weight eight kg. Now he is around 11.5 to 12 kilos in the four months after discharge, almost off diuretics altogether. With a good bioventricular function, the LV doesn't look small anymore, and he is absolutely hale and hearty. Touch wood. So, uh, just to summarize what we went through in uh, the data, why do we have to suffer so much in heterotaxis syndromes? This is it. Now, sepsis or heterotaxis syndromes is a very common association, and aspenia or polyspenia is associated with splenic dysfunction. The predisposition sepsis relates to the quality and the quantity of spleen available. So it doesn't mean the polysplenic patient may essentially be a very good immunity. If the quality of spleen is bad, it is going to be of no use. The presence of Howell jolly bodies, which indicates splenic dysfunction, also indicates the susceptibility to infection. And the test which is done for that is a pocket erythrocyte test, which is called PIT, which is done by interference microscopy, and a PIT count more than 3.8% indicates splenic hyperfunction. So basically, this is related to the spleen function of sort of whatever the abnormal cells they are capped, phagocytized, and destroyed in spleen. That is not happening. The risk of overwhelming sepsis is highest in the young infants with fatality rates around 40 to 50. And that is the significant mortality. Infants more than less than six months, they are likely to go for gram negative sepsis by the antibacteria, your E. coli, Klebsiella all these organisms and uh, Enterobacter, whereas the unusual organisms like Burkhodaria, Capnocytophagia, Babesia, besides cellular capsular microbes, they can also happen in patients because of the lack of splenic function. And hence, of late, we have very strong recommendations to treat asplenic patients with daily penicillin or amoxicillin prophylaxis up to 16 years or life or long, in fact, lifelong now. And for infants up to six months, you use a trimethoprim sulfamethazoxazole core recommendation. So the dose is very much clear that for amoxicillin, if you have a dose of 10 milligram per kg per dose twice a day, that's good enough. And trimethoprim sulfamethazoxazole can be given at something like a four milligram per kg per day. Now, vaccination, which is the other name to prevent certain capsular infections, are predatory valent pneumococcal vaccine beyond two years of age, and if below two years, then heptavalent conjugate. Whereas HIP is also a consistent norm, and in areas where your meningococcal sepsis and everything is common, you may also have to give the vaccines related to meningococci and all that stuff. We also face a lot of respiratory issues. What's the basis of that? And literature is now emerging with ciliary dysfunction, resulting in post-operative lung complications in patients with heterotaxy syndromes is recognized. And the reason is the etiogenesis of heterotaxy syndrome involves the same genes which are coding for ciliary function in embryogenesis. And hence, <coughs> something very similar to your cystic fibrosis, that sort of ciliary dysfunction also happens in children with heterotaxy syndrome. 
Unrecognized ciliary dysfunction is actually one of the factors which contributes to poor secretion clearance, atelectasis, and recurrent chest infection in these patients. And hence, a lot of stress on humidification throughout, even when they are not in the ICU, they are at home. And they also require vigorous respiratory therapy with bronchodilators and mucolytics to make sure the secretions do not get stuck again and again. So when you take care of this patient, it's only not only about taking the patient from the ICU and sending it home. You have to counsel them regarding the future problems, what they can face, how they can deal with it, so that they do it better. Okay. Gastrointestinal issues, which a lot of you, the senior guys out here, would be aware of the bowel rotation. This is associated with heterotaxy, significant, up to 70%. And mid gut volvulus is known to occur in units and infants with bilious, vomiting, bloody diarrhea, and acute abdomen. The abdominal UC shows a whirlpool sign, a wrap of a mesentery on the superior mesenteric artery. That leads to the whirlpool sign. And the LAD operation is the electric intervention for the mild rotation done after the cardiac procedures. So after the mild rotation is normally taken care of after the cardiac procedure is, or the cardiac problem is taken care of. Somebody may not have a volvulus or a mild rotation all the time, but feeding difficulties, failure to thrive, recurrent aspirations, atypical abdominal pain are very commonly associated with heterotaxis syndrome, and hence one has to be cognizant of this. Finally, biliary atresia is associated with 10% of cases who have polysplenia, but manifest with obstructive jaundice. The other rare associations are pre-portal duodenal vein, which again leads to an obstructive jaundice because of indirect compression, undescended appendix, anal atresia, and tracheoacidal fistula. So finally, to conclude, the five-year survival rate is approximately 35% for asplenic patients and 61% for polysplenic patients. This is an extremely difficult substrate to deal with. But as the time is passing, I think all of us are getting more wiser, and that is the reason our surgeons are becoming more confident in handling such cases as well. So probably it's a the, once you get more experience, probably you get more complex cases, and you deal with them, you learn more, and you says that's how you proceed in the careers, all of us for that matter. And in the current era, where tertiary care teams are taking up serious challenges. We, will, we definitely are going to see more such scenarios as parents also get influenced towards bioventricular repair, especially looking at the long-term improvement in the quality of life. And I seriously hope that this brief presentation gives you a broad understanding of the heterotaxis syndrome associated with its systemic concerns. Thanks a lot for a very patient hearing. Thank you. Questions can follow. CVP, I just, just, if you can, uh, just show that on the screen again. What is the ideal CVP for proceeding? I did not read the whole question, unfortunately. As uh, we know, that if you would do the, as, again, very important to see your IVC collapsibility, A, your ventricle sizing, and what is the, if when, you, when a patient is received from the OT, always you should ask, what was the, primary CVP before you put started the surgery and what was the CVP after recovering from surgery. That gives you a fair idea as to where you were before and how much of the myocardium has got affected. So for somebody who has gone from a CVP of 10 before surgery to a CVP of 20 to maintain the same blood pressure, obviously there's a significant amount of ventricular dysfunction. There, if you try to get a CVP of 10, you'll have significant hypertension. So you will have to maintain a CVP of 15 to 16 at least. So this is entirely a dynamic process which is aided by the preoperative information, the immediate postoperative while coming off surgery, how you receive the patient in the ICU, how swollen it is, and also you also look at the IVC as well as the basic ventricle chambers. Um, Sanjeeva has asked how to decide on bioventricular repair in presence of hyperplastic ventricle. Again, Sanjeev, if you have gone to the earlier part of lecture, you have to see the rootability of the VSD and the AV valve index. So that will give you some sort of an idea. Besides, as the other caveats which we had mentioned regarding the pulmonary vein streaming and everything, that also has to be taken into cognizance. Most important, how brave is your surgeon and cardiologist, and how good is your ICU team? Because these cases are not going to go off in a jiffy. Anybody else? Thanks for that. Thank you.